now welcome our panel up to the stage and I'll um, <clears throat> quickly introduce them whilst they're coming up because we're running over a little bit. British Land is um, one of the leading UK property companies when it comes to sustainability. To give you a flavour, they've reduced energy use across their portfolio by 27% since 2009. Uh, they're the leading company in the CDP's Carbon Disclosure Index for Property, and they're in the Dow Jones Sustainable Index and the FTSE for Good. Uh, Lucinda Bell uh, joined British Land in 1991 and became the Finance Director in May 2001. Uh, we believe she is one of nine female C CFOs in the FTSE 100, um, which, is, which compares to just two in 2008, so that's, uh, that's progress. Um, Tim Haywood uh, <coughs> is sitting next to uh, Alan here. Um, with 50,000 people and revenues of 2.3 billion, InterServe is a global support services and construction company. Uh, it's very telling that Tim is the only person we're aware of globally who combines the role of CFO and Head of Sustainability. So I don't know what that says about InterServe or, or possibly Tim. Um, they've, they've got big plans and I'm sure we'll hear a bit about them. And Tim uh, is there, <coughs> has been CFO since 2010. And finally, Jonathan, uh, probably no one, there's maybe one person in the room uh, who doesn't know who Jonathan is, this is for you. Um, <coughs> He started as an environmental campaigner. He chaired the Green Party in the 1980s, um, but he's increasingly become a critical friend to CEOs and boards. Through Forum for the Future, his fingerprints are on many of the best strategies, including M&S, uh, Unilever, and O2. So, Jonathan, I now hand over to you. Jim, thank you very much indeed, and uh, delighted to have a chance to have a bit of a panel discussion here first between my uh, three colleagues, and then we're going to widen it out for a more general uh, Q&A. So if I may, Lucinda and Tim, just to start with you. So you've heard this wonderful stuff from Alan. You look at those figures, as Jim said, and you think, my God, that's so bloody obvious, isn't it? I mean, here we go, sustainability ramping up every year. Don't ask Alan about next year's figures, because it's a bit too early to tell. But ramping up nicely as we go. Is it going to look like that for you in two, three years' time? Are you going to be able to give a presentation and show an equally significant and impactful slide showing how you've moved that forward? Tim, let's start with okay, you. Yeah. Well, I think unless I can, then I won't have fulfilled my mandate and I won't have done what I'm setting out to do, which is to make the business case for sustainability front and centre with our organisation and to demonstrate and to quantify the benefits from it. So I was watching that slide and thinking that's precisely where I want to get to. It's a journey and I'm sure Alan and his predecessors have got lots of uh, war stories about how difficult a journey it is because getting hold of the data, turning it into information and turning those information flows into decision makings are all difficult things. Mm. We're at the early start of the journey in that we've set out the ambition and we know what we want to deliver. And yes, it does look very similar to plan A. And will your benefits be as easy or as difficult to monetize as Alan said the plan A, the M&S benefits are? I think what Alan said about some benefits not being monetizable is good cautionary tale because I think we could spend an awful lot of time, effort and money in itself chasing down the minutia. So probably some of the things that we do may not be monetizable easily. The big things I think will be and they will be reaching across social, environmental and knowledge areas, not just environmental. Monetizing knowledge is going to be very interesting to, to watch. That will be fun. Lucinda. Um, for us, we believe that over the long term, if we provide our customers with buildings that are efficient, and that means sustainable, and are well integrated into their communities, they will perform better because our occupiers will be prepared to sign up to long leases, and it's those long leases, those long-term cash flows, that underpin our value and our performance. Measuring is very difficult at times, but there are times when you can do it. For instance, if I look at our um, energy costs that our occupiers pay in areas where we can influence it, 
over the last three years, those have reduced by 27%. Now, our target that we set ourselves was 20%. We've exceeded that, but we've set ourselves a new target. We'd like to have reduced it by 40% by 2015. But that's an example where, by reducing the costs for our occupiers, that means that our property is more affordable, and so that gives us a competitive edge. If I give you another example, one of the ways you can maximise the value of property is by improving the planning permission. That means getting more space available on a particular location or improving the quality of that planning permission so there's more flexibility. Well, we want to be a good neighbour. We want to be engaged in our communities. And by seeking to do that, that means that when we put a proposal to a local authority, we're more in touch with what that community wants. And that tends to mean that the speed with which that planning permission will be progressed, the ease of it, and the quality of what we can achieve are heightened through our engagement with our communities. Do you know of any company in your sector that has actually been able to demonstrate the financial value of those better relationships with planning committees? I think, it's, I think it's very difficult to do because it's, it's on a spectrum, isn't it? Perhaps that planning permission went through more quickly than it might otherwise have done, but you, you don't have your benchmark, your standard to compare to. But our experience is that buildings with good credentials will lease more quickly and you'll be in a better position to improve those planning permissions. There's only one little word in, in what you said there, Lucinda, which slightly worries me, which is the word will. I mean, the occupiers will reward you for this. Are they not already doing it right now? I, I, th I think there are two things there. There's the performance of the asset, the properties, and there's the letting of the properties to occupiers. And our experience is that properties with those good credentials do let more quickly than ones without them. Over the long term, will that translate into better investment performance? Our belief is that it does today and it will, but if you actually look at the academic research, to date there is nothing that would um, be overwhelmingly convincing that that is the case. And that's from the research that I've seen, maybe there's other research you've seen. So both of you in a way are confirming what Alan ended his presentation with, which is we haven't quite cracked this language to persuade your own shareholders that this is going to work to their benefit, certainly not as yet for you, Tim. I think, Alan, we know how hard it is to get m and investors to, not, I mean, they're more interested now than they used to be, but I'm not sure they're as completely bought in as you would want them to be. And certainly in terms of your sector, it would be great if we had a whole bunch of investors who really understood that conversion of benefit into benefit to them in the way that you're mapping out. So is this a, just a language thing or is it an evidence thing? that you were talking about? Um, in the real estate sector, you have investors at two levels. You have your shareholders and you have the investors in real estate. What we do see with our investors in our shares, um, particularly the Dutch investors, are very interested and focused in this area. The Scandinavians are growing in attention. And I was particularly struck, actually, on a recent trip to the US in the past, the US was not regarded as the most focused on this area, but I actually got many more questions than I would have had a year ago, so I think there's a trend there. We, we've been consulting uh, on our new plan with uh, investors and analysts as part of the building together of the consensus, and I went in with very low expectations, I have to say, that, uh, as Alan said, that the investor community is, has got a bit, a bit of a bad rep in, with this particular area. They're deemed to be sort of interested in the quarterly returns and uh, the long term for them doesn't stretch very far. What I did get from the consultation was that a, a belief that if we could convey that this sustainability initiative and this drive to responsible capitalism, call it what you will, is actually driving business benefits then they would certainly subscribe to it. The other problem that they've come up with is that the very tag itself, sustainability, when attached with investment funds, is a byword for underperformance. And therefore, within the investor community, an SRI fund is something to be steered, steered away from in some respects. And we, we need to more mainstream investment and sustainability 
and see that there isn't that disconnect, that it's not a choice between good performance and sustainable performance, but actually they are two of the same thing. And this is where I think int integrated reporting plays a key role. I, I really believe that if, and, and I have my concerns about implementation of it, um, but actually I do believe that by creating a narrative, which is the way we talk to our investors, which is through the report and accounts, in an integrated way, then actually we force that conversation to be not a separate one, but one to be integral to the business. Mm. Tim, you're just being a, a tiny bit gentle, I think, on your investors. I mean, their ignorance about SRI uh, bears out their general um, inability to cope with this agenda, I think. I mean, if they honestly do think that SRI funds are, in general, underperforming, it shows you how disconnected they are from understanding what's actually happening in the investment markets today. SRI funds do not underperform. SRI funds perform just as well as conventional funds. So the fact you get this stuff played back at you all the time is so deeply disturbing. And I just do hope that for any other CFOs and any other investor director, investor relations people out there, you have to challenge this stuff from your investors. They are signally ignorant about a lot of this. So I'm not sure that part of the job here isn't to be very challenging to your investors and really do work them over when they come up with these kind of platitudes and cliches and areas of ignorance. I mean, do you sometimes want to get up and shake them about a bit? <laughs> well, I have to be a bit careful because they do pay the wages at the end of the day. But uh, no, no, you're right. Uh, the, there, is, there are always elements of a business's strategy that you get exasperated that you can't get across to investors. But again, as Alan quite rightly said, we must hold ourselves to account as well if we moan that the investment community isn't understanding our sustainability mm. aspirations, well, look to yourself. Are we explaining it enough, regularly enough? And yeah, are, are mm. we actually challenging them? And I absolutely have, as part of my uh, new plan, a, a target to increase investor engagement and actually get them to understand what it is that we're trying to do. Alan, does it make any difference that the Plan A account is uh, properly assured by Ernst & Young so that when you're talking to investors there's no difference between the assurance of that data than the assurance of any other data in the annual report. Does that, does that actually make a difference to them or what, what, how does that grab you? Uh, I don't think it makes a difference to the investors because I think if we're clear about it from an investor perspective, our plan A assurance is too disconnected from our, really from our narrative mm. at the moment. Um, I think it's, I, I do think it's really important though from a lot of the overall credibility which our plan A program has in the minds of the, um, all of those people who are influential in that. So if there is a, um, um, an NGO or a, um, an organization which is monitoring us and then the fact that we've got an externally um, assured report on it actually gives that a lot mm. of credibility which helps the trust and credibility which ultimately does play back into mm. the overall view from us because a lot of the investors treat the, um, the, the sustainability agenda within another part of their own organization. They ultimately do talk to each other, but the fund manager who makes the investment decision um, very often isn't thinking about that. Although ultimately they do come together in a lot of the feedback which we get from a governance and, a, and an overall credibility perspective. We, we recently undertook an exercise to look at our socio-economic contribution from our development programme where we're um, developing two million square feet in London and um, that's generating over 30,000 jobs in the construction industry. And we had that independently verified by one of the big four, and that definitely made a difference to the way that people could accept the output from that, particularly because that wasn't based about assumptions about what would happen in the future, which was, but was actually based on actual commitments we had made, and actually where those jobs were sourced across the UK, not only in the southeast, could be traced and located. And so it gave a, a veracity and a confidence to it that I, I think did add to the power of those, those outputs, which were very strong. Mm. Just, I want to come back to the integrated reporting thing, if I may, in a moment, Alan. Just on this concept of value at risk, I mean, obviously, this is a, 
a concept that doesn't go to the top line to the growth opportunities, but certainly helps fix in the mind of investors that there are reputational or real physical risks to the business models that all of you have. Do you find that that is now a more widely shared assumption about how companies generate value, and this value is at risk because of some of the sustainability pressures that Alan mapped out. Is this, a, is this something that resonates at all? Well, I look at it in terms of reward is a, re is a return for taking risk. So there are some risks that you will willingly take to generate your reward, and there are other risks you want to manage. And clearly, within the responsibility agenda, there are some very clear risks for management, but also there are times where you may take a considered risk because of the returns it may offer you. For us, I think the value at risk is, is a very strong part of the agenda in a number of areas. Um, maybe the obvious ones of the environmental are, are well known, I won't rehearse them here, but for us there's, there's also employee-related, human-related value at risk, mm. which I think is quite key to our agenda, that the costs of an uneducated, untrained, unskilled, and therefore demotivated workforce is very significant in terms of turnover, recruitment, costs, all that sort of stuff. Our operations in the Middle East, the, the value at risk there is, is really down at a, a basic human rights level where it absolutely behoves us to ensure the continued existence of our operations there, that we are treating our immigrant workforce in their labour camps at an absolutely appropriate mm. level. So value at risk for us is writ very, very large. And then, of course, you've got you know, the, the basic health and safety of being a construction business. Well, number one item on our agenda always and forever has been health and safety. Stitching that into our wider sustainability <coughs> programme is actually quite an easy task. Mm. So just to, before we come to the, the wider Q&A, just thinking of it from these three perspectives, what's the one thing that would help you all move this forward just a little bit faster. I mean, it has taken us, we were just chatting about this before, it's taken us quite a long time to get to the, the broad recognition that sustainability is not antipathetic to good business practices and to generating good sustainable profits over time. It's taken a very long time to get to that point. Now we do need to move it forward really significantly faster. So is it going to be integrated reporting that helps with that? Is it going to be mandatory carbon accounting? Is it going to be different disclosure requirements? Is it going to be the pressure of NGOs? I can't help but notice that that is sometimes still a pretty significant factor in getting companies to do things they weren't inclined to do before. And you mentioned various examples of that. What's the one thing that's really going to get it moving faster? For you, Lucinda. British land. Would it be Greenpeace? Abseiling up and down buildings saying British land are just not on the side of the angels. What's the one story which would really make a difference? I, I think there's a great piece here about how we benchmark and compare ourselves to each other and there's beginning to be a sense of a global benchmark and how people compare on that. Because, for instance, in our industry, Australia's been doing a lot mm. for a period of time and how we can actually learn from that. I think the, the, there's a willingness to do these things. At times you want a little bit of help with a bit of clarity from a regulatory and a legislative point of view because you can want to do something, but if you haven't got certainty there, it can we hold you back from going ahead. That's a particular area we've actually had to amend some of our targets because there hasn't been clarity. And I think then that helps people make comparisons. Is there a sectoral comparator which would really help investors understand? Is it CO2 intensity per meter squared? Is there something which you would like to say in your sector on this one, we now want to be measured against all our other competitors and we want to be top of that league? I, I, I don't think we're advanced enough yet to have the answer to that, but I hope that we will do as we, as we develop our thinking over it. I mean, what we have seen is the more you get into this, the more you understand what it is you're measuring. At times it can be disheartening when you find out what your measurement is for and, and, and how you can then, but once you start measuring it, you can tackle it and you can start to reduce it. But it is, it's like peeling an onion, isn't it? You go through these layers and layers and layers of understanding, but it's only by confronting it and measuring it that we can make progress. Mm. 
for me, I, I mean, it's, it's a very unfair question to ask what is the silver bullet that'll solve the world. But if I did have to come up with an answer, because you're sat next to me and you're, you're looking like I need to come up with an answer. Um, I, I'd say it, it's actually about what tonight is about. It's about leadership. I think a determined leader in the right position in an organisation, and I hope one day to be one of those within InterServe, can actually move all of these, they're micro problems, but they're very big micro problems, can move them all with the force of the entire organisation behind them. And you look what Stuart Rose has done, Jochen Zayetz has done, Paul Polman has done. That's, that's how you get uh, an organisation moving. And I genuinely believe that business as a force for good is well resourced, it's more nimble than say government can be, it's more effective than individuals can be. So if you get business leaders and maybe the skeptical finance people are a part of that challenge, then that's how you put in place all the other mechanisms to solve all of the other problems that each need a silver bullet. You mentioned Paul Polman there. Are you going to follow Unilever's example and not do quarterly updates? Well, mercifully, we don't have to do quarterly financial updates. We just do a quick narrative thing, and I would love to be able to, <laughs> to minimise the amount of blather we have to give to the city, and <laughs> less can be more. We recently stopped quarterly reporting. You did. Actually, we stopped it. We're a long-term business, and we felt that there was no point giving a valuation every quarter, and we now do it every six months with, I'm pleased to say, under four pages for a quarterly update, which is trading information, but not valuation. And um, it's saved us money. It's been well received, actually. We haven't really had, I can say, almost, almost without exception, no objections. Yeah. A bit tricky, Alan, that one. Uh, yeah, well, silver bullets, they, um, the answer is definitely not accountants. <laughs> um, the, I, think, I think for me there are two areas that we should really focus on. The, um, I think within any sector there's a lot more that we can do than we might believe. We're all governed quite rightly by um, the um, anti-monopoly um, and, and the competition laws about what we talk about, but I do think that it, as sectoral people within the retail world, if we started to view this as something which we really wanted to make a difference on and got common measurement rather than issues which we could get good PR out of, then I think that that um, is an area where we could definitely make a difference. And the other area where I do think there are um, issues um, where actually legislation can be very, very helpful um, and is needed. Um, an example, I would, and I think that's something we just should think about. An example for me um, is, and this may be controversial, but I've always had the view that um, the mandatory um, enrolment of employees in pension schemes is something which in the UK we're way behind. But until it became mandatory from a government perspective, nobody would be prepared to do it. You look at other countries where um, saving for retirement, Australia being an example, is very, very much just part of the fabric because there's a, there's a mandatory requirement that corporates and companies do this, and you have a very different rate of saving. Here we're moving to that. It's costing all of us as an industry. We're not happy about it because the external environment is what it is. But actually, societally, we're getting mm -hmm. to a position where people are being actually you're opted in rather than having to opt in, and you have to, to opt out. So I think in big areas which have long-term societal benefit, actually, there is a role for government to play here. Thank you. That's a, a very useful reminder that uh, however many charismatic CEOs we might have out there doing their stuff, which is very welcome. Um, we still need a good regulatory framework. We still need governments that understand how best to enable markets and companies to deliver these benefits, which is uh, absolutely spot on. Right, so let's see now if there are some things that have triggered your uh, curiosity, interest, your sense of where this agenda ought to go. Uh, usual rules, if you wouldn't mind, there are various uh, microphones floating around. If you could just say who you are and where you come from, that would be great. And if you could keep it short, that would be even greater. Is the hand right at the back? Just keep, that's it. <laughs> just one mic, right? There's one, oh, there's one each side. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm Penny Shepherd from the UK Sustainable Investment and Finance Association. 
Uh, the finance function is often seen by the corporate pension fund as its primary interface into the company, particularly for defined benefit pension funds. Um, equally, one of the challenges that investors face is demand from their customers, including from pension funds. Um, to what degree are you concerned about sustainability risk being taken by the corporate pension fund? And what are you doing to seek to influence that? Right. That's a very specific question. Um, uh, just to check, any other sort of interested questions in that sort of area broadly? Otherwise, I'll just get some quick answers from colleagues here. No? Okay. We'll move on to other areas after that. Alan, do you want to start with that? Right. Well, we, ha we have a defined benefit um, pension fund which... Um, happens to be closed to new members, um, but it's a pretty big fund. It's got about roughly six billion of assets and six billion of liabilities, um, tens of thousands of members. Um, so it's, it's a big issue for us. Um, from their perspective, um, the, it's run, and from our perspective, it's run very separately by a, a pension trustee um, board and who deal with the investment. But because of the ethos under which we would want them to be investing. Clearly, the um, issue of sustainability is something which they look at. I think for the same reasons that we've been talking about earlier, um, until the, the, you're right, the, until the providers of capital start questioning the fund managers of that capital as to what they're dealing with it, um, there will continue to be a disconnect. So there are two ways to address the issues I've been talking about. One is for us to talk about it. Others is for those providers of capital to talk about it. But ultimately, many providers of capital are just chasing shorter-term money than long-term sustainable views. And that's a challenge, I think, for the investment industry, not only the specific pension fund industry. Just a, to, to add to that, that the, some of the regulatory requirements around the fiduciary role of the trustees adds an additional burden for them to take suboptimal returns from, or what might look like suboptimal returns from a sustainability investment, and therefore they have additional hurdles. But again, like Alan, we try our best to get those sort of thinkings front and center with the trustees, but they are their own people. Have your trustees ever asked the uh, members what they feel about these things? About investments, about yes, but about criteria. sustainability, no. No, they haven't. Do you think that would be an interesting sort of innovation? I think, it, I think it would be interesting, and it might tell the trustees uh, some things they'd be surprised about, I actually. It might. Yeah. I think it might, really. Yeah. Uh, we have a very small um, uh, pension scheme, which is also close to new members, but I, I think that's an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Penny. Right. Yes, uh, again at the back. There. Um, Matt Hale from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Um, first of all, thank you very much. An excellent series of, of, of uh, discussions. Um, I just wanted to talk about not the silver bullet, but it's something that I think has the potential to really um, grow very rapidly, which is the whole concept of, of, of exploiting and working with your supply chain. And clearly that came out in, in the Plan A discussion, but more generally, individual companies can do whatever they can do to drive their own sustainability agenda but the more they can also look backwards and around them to try to impact all the other people that they interact with, not necessarily to, to help design their own products, but actually just to help them realize that they actually have a broader role to play. I think that's the, w that's the way you can really move things even faster. And again, this is not to do with governments, this is to do with companies basically working with each other. I want to get the, the panel's thoughts on, on what you can do or what, or, or, and how you can accelerate that process. Any other thoughts on supply chain issues? We're going to ask Alan in particular about the competition aspects of that, collaboration between different companies in same sectors. It's, it's sort of interesting how you get scale in this. Any other supply chain related stuff? Alan, just very quickly on this because we've... I, I think there's probably more that we can do than we might realize despite competition. Um, for us, we have um, part of our procurement process is tendering um, um, for um, a lot of almost all of our major um, purchases would go to tender if we're dealing with goods for resale then we've got very clear sourcing um, imperatives and on both of those metrics the element of sustainability is something which we take into account there's probably we're probably for further ahead in the goods for resale than in the goods not for resale and for us that's a clear opportunity um, and um, it's something we focus on 
now having got a closer procurement process and a stronger procurement process than we've ever had before, I think there's more that we can do. And it's a, it's a good prompt. Thanks, Matt. I'd just add, as part of our uh, community charter, one of the commitments we make for our community charter for the areas which we own properties, we want to try and engage more with suppliers in those local areas. And we have a sustainability brief which we roll out for our development programmes and also for the way that we run our um, owned investment assets. And we use that to seek to um, convince our suppliers to adopt similar principles. And most recently, we've been focusing on apprenticeships. And so far in the, the year just passed, we've instigated the creation of 80 apprenticeships. The majority of those have actually been through the supply chain. We, we do about two thirds of our work for government and government's procurement is actually in this area. It's very prescriptive in many areas, but in this area, it's helpfully prescriptive because it does require us to embrace SMEs, embrace local employment, embrace sustainable procurement. And from that, especially working with the Ministry of Defence, actually, which I think is a beacon of good practice in this area, we've adopted a lot of those practices ourselves and now roll those out to other parts of our supply chain. There's, there's too many of them to sort of enumerate here, but read our sustainability report for all of the details. But actually in that area, government and a big supply lever can really make quite an exponential impact. So I agree with uh, Matt's question there. Mm, mm. Thank you. Right, there was just another hand very close to you, Matt, there, just a couple of rows back, and, and I'll come to you next. Hi there, it's Steve Jarvis um, from Carbon Clear. Um, the case for um, cost reduction um, and sustainability seems quite clear cut, but I'm quite interested about the revenue angle, and particularly I'd like to ask you, Alan, about the energy business. Um, to what extent has the sustainability plan A uh, energy mix of your, e your energy product um, been a factor in customers switching um, to your energy uh, service? Um, we, renewable energy is a, is, is a clear part of what we offer and it's part of what we, um, we will commit to deliver um, to our customers. Um, I'm, I don't think that we, when we look at the, the reasons why people have switched to us, um, the green energy isn't, and this again is a, a, a comment on our customers and what they're saying, it's not high up the reasons for why they, they, they have switched to us. It's more to do with the trust and the credibility of the overall M&S brand. But contained within that is clearly plan A and what we're seeking to do. And contained within it is clearly the um, environmental elements of energy, which we then um, positively incentivize customers to, to go after. So whilst it's not one of the first reasons, actually it's part and parcel of the overall product. And I think it is one of the reasons in truth why we have grown to become number seven in the UK. So it's not front of mind, but it's part of the whole package. And it's something which we wouldn't want to give up um, as, as part of what we're offering for all the reasons we've spoken about. Big expectations, Alan. Obviously, people talk usually quite disparagingly about the big six. I imagine you might be a bit nervous if they started talking about the big seven. I'd be delighted. And M&S <laughs> was there lumped in together without a properly differentiated set of benefits that your consumers would get from being in that uh, particular part, you know, system. So it's an interesting place where you are at the moment in that regard. Right. Um, hello, Seb Bilo from Web uh, Asset Management. Um, as an investor, I've sat through a lot of uh, presentations from CEOs and CFOs, and in, in my experience, the better ones are framed around a set of reasonably long-term, by which I mean maybe three-year, uh, financial objectives, whether that's in terms of market share or you know, um, margin expansion or, or just profitability. Um, and it seems to me that what needs to be done in terms of those presentations is to frame the sustainability programs in terms of how they feed into those medium-term objectives. So how does your sustainability program help you to expand your margins through, for example, reducing costs associated with energy? Or you know, build your brand and your market share through the overall um, pr presentation of the sustainability program. But the key thing is to frame it around those, those medium-term financial objectives. Can you do that? Who does it best, in your opinion? I, to be honest, I don't think anyone does it at all well. So at the moment, that is still a prize that is out there for someone to be able to demonstrate 
how you align all of these sustainability benefits against the strategic objectives of the company. Still not done properly in your, and you see a lot of these things, still not done properly. Interesting. Okay. Reflections on that? Is the Inserve Plan A equivalent, is that now aligned against the big headline commercial imperatives of Interserve? Is it that yes, closer fit? I, I think it is. I, I mean, the gauntlet has been well and truly thrown down there, and we'll, we'll see if, it, if we respond properly. But when we set out to create our plan, one of the first things we, well, the thing we started with was the operational business plan and the strategy, rather than a few disparate um, sustainability initiatives. It was precisely that way around. Now, if in our communication in the next few months, we can start to replay that and say, well, this target and this goal fits with this strategic objective, then we will be on our way. Uh, the case is not proven yet, but it's, it's a very good uh, reference point to have in mind. So, Alan, there's an interesting story. You've just heard a presentation from mm -hmm. Alan and mm -hmm. still not sorted yet, in your opinion. So what would it take for m and to do that n you know, next time around, to get that really tight alignment between what Mark, Mark <coughs> Bolland is now pressing for in terms mm -hmm. of the company objectives and what Plan A is delivering? I don't think, I don't disagree with what you're saying in terms of the, the clarity and the, um, and, and the presentation f to marry it absolutely to a, an, um, an objective. I do think that it's, um, it's more complex than that. So for instance, our, um, for our, in our clothing business, our suppliers and the way that the work we have with our suppliers is absolutely critical to the whole of our sustainability agenda. Um, to put that, and yes, we have margin targets for, for gross margin of bought-in goods, um, but for us, um, I actually think, if I'm honest, we could probably find suppliers who could provide product more cheaply for us than what our sustainability agenda provides. But that's not what we see as our role, because in the long run, that's the, not the way we want to do business. So I think the marrying of those two things isn't always clear. What we can do and will always do, and this goes to reputation, is the last thing we want to be is to be tarred with a, um, a child labor, a um, taking advantage of um, a sourcing country, because that would go to the heart of our credibility and from our, what our customers believe. So I think the credibility and, and, the, and the, the clarity of that medium-term objective with um, some of our as important, more important, long-term objectives doesn't always gel as, as clearly. But for us, it's critical because if we know if we don't do that, then we won't be delivering what we believe is the right long-term sustainable answer. But I don't disagree with what you're saying in terms of okay. if we could get there. I, I think it's very simply a, a, a reflection of how much these matters are embedded within the way one thinks about it and how much emphasis one puts on them in investor meetings and investor presentations, both points that we've, we've, we've covered today. But I, I think it's an interesting challenge. Yes, Embe embedded has to be visibly embedded, doesn't it? That's the sort of issue, really. We've yes. got time, I think, for one more. Is that right, Jim? Right, so we have one more already uh, raring to go. Table six. So maybe finish with a slightly tongue-in-cheek question. Um, you've mentioned, Alan, that we're a bit of a self-selecting group here. Um, and I wondered if you'd had any conversations with the more skeptical finance directors, your colleagues, and what sort of arguments have really won the day other than just saying it makes good business sense and we will make more money, save money. Is there anything else that's helped make the case? I think getting people who are um, skeptical to engage in the discussion about it is actually the biggest challenge. So you end up, to a certain degree, always talking with those who are at least part way down the, down the, 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 the spectrum. Um, but I think it is actually the, um, to the skeptics, to the people who don't see the benefit, probably the costs that can be directly um, measured and saved as a result of it is the best way to get people engaged. Um, it's not an easy task, though, because there is this, um, in, in some of the skeptics, there's a very clear belief that all of this stuff doesn't really matter. And I guess that comes down to philosophy as much as anything else. Ultimately, though, my, my belief is that whatever line of business you're in, whether it's a, con a 
consumer-facing business or, as I said in my um, talk, a B2B business. If we talk about it enough and if customers actually and society views it as relevant, then it has to be relevant for everybody. Mm. Tim? Uh, just, just a couple of things. I, I would rather engage in dialogue with a skeptic than have to face the passive terrorism of somebody for whom there isn't a conversation to be had. And during our consultations over our plan, we've, we've encountered both. And the, the, re, the way to make it relevant, I believe, and I've been told by all the people who've advised me on this, is actually to you know, align incentives with behaviors and then you start turning the skeptics into believers and the passive terrorists into hmm, I'd better do something about this whether I believe it or not. <laughs> I'm still conjuring up the prospect of a passive terrorist. It's sort of a bit of an oxymoron for me, but I, I'll come back to you on that uh, later. Lucinda. Um, I think from a finance perspective, when you're measuring something, you're able, able to show concrete results which are subject to a third party assurance review, that gets people's attention. And also, if you're a competitor and you're getting good press coverage because of what you're able to say, that also gets people's attention. And that's a way of perhaps converting the passive whatever into a starting to have a, a dialogue. And I think evidence helps a lot. The more evidence we have, the stronger the case you can make. Because you keep pushing back, keep pushing back on the skepticism with the evidence, it does make a real difference. Jim, I think we may well have come to the end of our allotted time for this, for this uh, part of the procedure. That, that was <clears throat> truly uh, fantastic um, and very exciting to hear three CFOs speaking in a way that sustainability folk uh, <clears throat> normally speak. So can we, and thank you, Jonathan, for chairing. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Just a few um, final things from me. Uh, Green Monday strives to deliver the best debates without charge, without barriers. If you like what we do, please thank our sponsors because they enable it to happen. Keypads, we get charged 30 pounds if you walk off with a keypad. You can't transfer money with them. Um, so if, if you could hand them all in on your way out, there'll be someone with a box there and they'll be collecting up if you just leave it on chairs and tables as well. Next month, we look at trust. We have the uh, CEO of EDF, one of the big six we've been talking about um, uh, and others on our panel. And I think that'll be a very timely and uh, very uh, interesting evening. And finally, FIFO, you'll all get an email saying, how did you rate your various parts tonight? Um, please do fill it in if you can. It gives us an approval rating, which is currently 96%. Uh, but it also tells us what we need to improve, and it's our innovation uh, strategy. So thank you all. It's been a fantastic debate tonight. Uh, thank you.